platform to avoid feedback. <laughs> it's good to see everybody. How are you? Great. Uh, Betsy, I've been gone for two weeks, and um, so it's good to be back. And um, we we missed you. You guys are some of our favorite people. Wow. We missed you guys and too. So we, um, you know, it's it's just good to be back with family. And um, the Yokums are out of town. They've gone up to Tennessee, so they're going to. Um, be gone, I think, um, this weekend and next weekend, I believe. So we'll just remember them in our prayers. And I don't, if, um, I don't know if Pablo is getting this captured um, for uh, Facebook or not. But in case he is, we'll just do a shout out to the Yokums. Hey guys, we love you, we miss you, and hope you're having a good time up there. Um, it's good to see Abigail back with us from school. Yay! I'm glad to have my daughter and granddaughter, uh, Elizabeth and Alan, here with this morning. Do we have any other visitors here? Just a friend. No, I just couldn't go to the airport with us today to get Julia. Okay, great. Glad to have you with us. All right, and I, a little birdie told me. Uh, the birdie's name was Pablo, that today's Kathy's birthday. Happy birthday! Birthday girl, right down here. We, we have to 48th. 48th. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Kathy. Happy birthday to you. Well, I have a little um, scripture to share with you, actually, um, as a call to worship. And um, I chose it out of the book of Colossians because our reading this week um, from our books of the Bible in the New Testament. Are you guys enjoying it? Yes. We're, we're getting along in there. So this week we were in Ephesians and Colossians and Philippians and Philemon. And... Um, so my message for you a little later this morning is going to be from the book of Philemon. Um, I thought I was going to be preaching either from Ephesians or Colossians or Philippians because so those are three of my favorite New Testament books. And I thought, wow, I get to really get into some of the meat from those books. And, but my attention kept going to Philemon. So that's going to be what we're going to talk about. But I wanted to take our call to worship out of Colossians, the first chapter where Paul is saying, we pray that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, 
by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for shedding your blood on the cross, for reconciling us to God. Lord, we are so thankful today to be in you. Lord, to be a part of your family. We're thankful, Lord, that you brought us here this morning together. And we acknowledge your presence here with us. Lord, as you promised, that where two or three are gathered in your name, you will be in their midst. So, Lord, we know you are here in our midst. Yes. And we are privileged and honored to be here in your presence. Lord, let everything that's done today, during this time, be pleasing to you. Please bring the anointing of your Holy Spirit, Lord, on all that is done. Our singing, our praising, our worshiping, the prayers that we pray, the, the word of God that comes forth, the message, our, even our fellowship, the way we relate to one another. Let it all, Lord, be pleasing to you. Be glorified in this place today, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and praise the Lord.
Hallelujah.
just bow our hearts before you. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you for your loving kindness and your mercies that are new every morning. We are eternally grateful, Lord, for what you have done for us, Lord. You're so good to us. You take good care of us. Lord, and even in the midst of this crazy time, we know that you're in control and we need not fear or have anxiety. Lord, we put all of our trust in you. We put all of our confidence in you. We want to keep our eyes on you. So, Lord, we just continue our worship of you. We want to bring to you our tithes and offerings this morning. And we ask you to bless them and multiply them. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Southern Gospel. Yeah. Can you pick that yeah. way? <laughs> Love it. So, do we have any testimonies this morning? Anybody want to give us a report on how good the Lord is in your life? I'm up and moving. <laughs> Say it again. I'm up and moving. You're up and moving. <laughs>
as I told you, oh, somebody dropped their phone out in the hallway. Oh, Does, do you recognize this, anybody? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Are you out there looking for it? Yeah. <laughs> so, as I said, we're going to be in the book of Philemon this morning. Now, I must confess, I've never preached from Philemon. In fact, I don't remember ever hearing a preacher preach from Philemon in the pulpit. I studied Philemon when I was in college and in, in graduate school, and um, studied it, you know, because it's part of um, biblical studies, part of the New Testament. But it's just not a, it's not a book of the Bible that um, people pay a lot of attention to um, and preach from very often. Have you, have you ever heard sermons just from? One. one? Okay, you've heard one. Out of 40 years. Out of 40-some years. Oh, no. I've never heard it. Okay. So, but not very often, right? No. no. And so I don't even know, you know, perhaps in, as we're going through the books of the New Testament, perhaps this is the first time you've actually read it. It's, um, you know, it's one, of, it's one of Paul's letters. And, um, you know, Paul's letters make up the bulk of the New Testament. This is the shortest one of his letters, only 335 words in Greek. Um, and it's a personal letter. Most, most of his letters are addressed to churches. This one's addressed to an individual, so it falls under what we call the pastoral epistles. And so um, we're going to read the, uh, an entire book of the Bible uh, in this sermon today. But before we read it, um, I want to let you see a little overview of the book of Philemon uh, with some animation to go along with it to give you just a little bit of background. So um, if, if you guys can pull that up, uh, this lasts about six minutes, but it's kind of cute. I hope you'll enjoy it. I hope we can get some sound out of it. It was written during one of Paul's many imprisonments, and it's actually his shortest letter in the New Testament. But don't let its size trick you. It's actually one of the most explosive things that Paul ever wrote. Here's the backstory that we can piece together some details within the letter. Philemon was a well-to-do Roman citizen from Colossae, who likely met Paul during his mission in Ephesus, and he became a follower of Jesus. Then later, when Paul's co-worker Epaphras started a Jesus community in Colossae, Philemon became a leader of a church that met in his house. Now, Philemon, like all household patriarchs in the Roman world, owned slaves, one of whom was named Onesimus. And at some point, these two had a serious conflict. Onesimus wronged Philemon in some way. Maybe it was theft, or maybe he cheated him, we don't exactly know. But afterwards, Onesimus ran away. Eventually, Onesimus came to Paul in prison, likely to appeal for help. And in the process, he became a follower of Jesus, and then a beloved assistant of Paul. And so Paul finds himself in a very difficult and delicate situation as he writes this letter. He's going to ask Philemon not just to forgive Onesimus and receive him back, but to embrace him as a brother in the Messiah and no longer as a slave. Here's how he does it. Paul opens with a prayer, first praising Philemon and thanking God for the love and faithfulness he's shown to Jesus, to his people. And he then paves the way for his request with this line. I pray that the partnership that springs from your faith may effectively lead you to recognize all the good things that work in us, leading us into the Messiah. Now, the key word here is partnership, or in Greek, koinonia. It means sharing or mutual participation. It's when two or more people receive something together and share in it, becoming partners. Paul said that faithfulness to Jesus means recognizing that all of his followers are equal partners who share together in the gift of God's love and grace. And for Paul, this experience of koinonia among Jesus' followers is not just an idea that you think about, it's something that you do in your relationships. Which moves Paul on to his request. He finally brings up Onesimus. He says that he's become Paul's child in prison, meaning that Paul led Onesimus to dedicate his life and allegiance to Jesus, and so Paul and Onesimus are now family members in the Messiah. He's been serving Paul faithfully in prison, and even though Paul wants to keep him around, 
He knows that this unresolved conflict with Philemon has to be reconciled if they say that they're followers of Jesus, which moves Paul onto his bold request that Philemon receive Onesimus back no longer as a slave, but as more than a slave, as a beloved brother in the Lord. Now, this is a really tall order. Under Roman law, Philemon had every legal right to have Onesimus punished or put in prison. And Paul is not only asking him to forgive Onesimus, but to welcome back his former slave into Colossae as a social equal, as a family member. This is way more than kindness. This is unheard of. It's freeing a slave and then treating them like a family member. It upsets the status quo of the Roman social order. Why should Philemon do such a thing? And here Paul pulls a brilliant move. He recalls that key word from the opening prayer. He says, if you're truly a partner with me, it's that Greek word koinonia again, then welcome Onesimus as if he were me. And if he's wronged you or owes you anything, charge it to me and I will repay it. So in this request, we see the heart of Paul's gospel message being acted out. It's first of all about reconciliation. It's just like he told the Corinthians. In the Messiah, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. So in this situation, Paul is putting himself in the place of Jesus. He will absorb the consequences of Onesimus' wrongdoing. He will pay the cost so that he can be reconciled to Philemon. But Paul's message was about more than just a legal transaction. It's also about koinonia. Onesimus and Philemon and Paul are all equals before God. They all share the same need for forgiveness. And so the ground is level before the cross, which means that Philemon and Onesimus can no longer relate to each other as master and slave. They're family members. They're brothers in the Messiah. Or, as Paul told Philemon and the whole church of Colossae, in God's new family, people are not Greek or Jewish or circumcised or uncircumcised or foreigners or uncivilized or slave or free, but the Messiah is all and is in all people. Paul closes the letter stating his confidence that Philemon will do even more than Paul's requested. And he asks him to prepare a guest room because he wants to visit as soon as he gets out of prison. And then, with some final greetings, Paul ends the letter. Paul's letter to Philemon is powerful for many reasons. It's the only letter where Paul doesn't explicitly mention Jesus' death or resurrection, and this is not an oversight. He doesn't need to explain the cross with words because he's demonstrating it through his actions. Paul's embodying here the meaning of the cross. He has made himself the place through which Onesimus and Philemon are reconciled to God, and then to each other. This letter also shows us that the implications of the good news about Jesus, they are extremely personal and never private. The fact that Philemon and Onesimus are now brothers in the Messiah, it makes their master-slave relationship totally irrelevant. The family of Jesus' people is the place where all are equal recipients of God's grace. It's a new kind of society, or a new humanity, as he called it in the letter to the Colossians, where people's value and social status, it's not defined by race or gender or social or economic class. In the Messiah, there are simply new humans who are equal partners, who share together in God's healing mercy through Jesus. And that's what Paul's letter to Philemon is all about. All right. Cool, huh? Yeah. Uh, I did that because in six minutes they did a better job than I could do. <laughs> so I catch your breath now. That was a lot of information. Um, but good back good, good background uh, for this little uh, epistle. So I've entitled this message finally a tale of redemption because that's exactly what it is. And so now we need to read it. And I had pulled up a couple of translations. I was trying to decide what translation to read it from this morning in the pulpit. Because, you know, in our book that we're reading together, this is the New International Version, which is my default version. I always go back to the NIV ever since I was um, a, a Bible college student back in the early 70s. Um, the NIV was actually being translated during that time. And I have a background in the Church of Christ. One, there was the Church of Christ um, 
scholar on the, uh, the team of translators. And so we were like, wow, one of our guys is helping translate this. And so we started using this in the classroom. And it was really the translation that I was reading when God really spoke to me. I always struggled with the King James Version. Um, but the NIV kind of opened the scriptures to me. So I go back to it often. However, there are a lot of translations out there. And so I was looking at the New Living, New Living Translation. I was looking at the New King James, uh, the Modern English Version. Um, and I, but I decided to use a translation that I never um, had used when I teach or preach. And it's the J.D. Phillips translation. J.D. Phillips, let me give you just a little bit of background. He was an English scholar um, back in the, um, the 20th century, born in like 1906. And he was, um, he was a scholar during World War II. And during the London Blitz, when there were air raids, he was in a bomb shelter. And his, during his time in the bomb shelter, he started translating the New Testament because he worked with young people and they had a hard time understanding the scriptures. So he decided to translate the New Testament into a more, um, into, the, into the modern vernacular of that time. And so I'm gonna read his, his rendering, his translation of the book of Philemon for you. Paul, prisoner for the sake of Jesus Christ and brother Timothy to Philemon, our fellow worker, Athia, our sister, and Archippus, who is with us in the fight, to the church that meets in your house, grace and peace be to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God for you, Philemon, in my constant prayers for you all, for I have heard how you love and trust both the Lord Jesus himself and those who believe in him. And I pray that those who share your faith may also share your knowledge of all the good things that believing in Christ can mean to us. It is your love that gives us such comfort and happiness. For it cheers the hearts of your fellow Christians. And although I could rely on my authority in Christ and dare to order you to do what I consider right, I'm not doing that. No, I'm appealing to that love of yours. A simple, personal appeal from Paul, the old man, in prison, for Jesus Christ's sake. I'm appealing for my child. Yes? I have become a father, though I am under lock and key. And the child's name is Onesimus. <laughs> oh, I know you have found him pretty useless in the past, but he is going to be useful now to both of us. Let me stop there for just a minute. Pause. Hit the pause button. Onesimus means useful. The name means useful. So Paul, he's playing on the word, on the name Onesimus here. He says, I know you have found him pretty useless, but he is going to be useful now to both of us. I am sending him back to you. Will you receive him as my son, part of me? I should have dearly loved to have kept him with me. He could have done what you would have done, looked after me here in prison for the gospel's sake, but I would do nothing without consulting you first, for if you have a favor to give me, let it be spontaneous and not forced from you by circumstances. It occurs to me that there has been a purpose in your losing him. You lost him, a slave, for a time, now you are having him back for good, not merely a slave, but a brother Christian. 
he is already especially loved by me, how much more will you be able to love him both as a man, as a man, and as a fellow Christian? You and I have so much in common, haven't we? Then do welcome him as you would welcome me. If you feel he has wronged you or cheated you, put it down to my account. I've written this with my own hand. I, Paul, hereby promise to repay you. Of course, I'm not stressing the fact that you might, if you might be said to owe me your very soul. Now, if you grant me this favor, my brother, such an act of love will do my old heart good. As I send you this letter, I know that you'll do what I ask. I believe, in fact, you'll do more. Will you do something else? Get the guest room ready for me, for I have great hopes that through your prayers, I myself will be returned to you as well. Epaphras, here in prison with me, sends his greetings. So do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, all fellow workers for God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. What you think? You know, it just confirms to me what I've always said since I've been a student of the scriptures. Paul was a character yes. with a capital C. You know, and it's interesting to me that the scriptures um, are written by many different people, and God has given us his word and allowed it to come through flesh and blood, people with various distinct, unique personalities, and Paul's no exception to that. Paul has his own personality, and I've often wondered, you know, how likable Paul was. I don't know, I just, I think maybe people fell into two camps, you know, they thought Paul was great, or they, you know, they didn't care much for him, because he sometimes was, Paul, <laughs> you know, his personality just came through, and so I, I read one um, take on the book of Philemon where the guy said, you know, if I had received this letter, I would be steaming mad, <laughs> because, you know, Paul's approach, you know, is like, I don't want to twist your arm or anything as you hear bones crunching. <laughs> But could you do this for me, please? You know. So, you know, he's getting his permission, but boy, he's kind of he's kind of like tightening the screws as he does it. So it's great, you know, because this is a little personal letter, and some people could even be amazed and surprised that this little personal letter found its way into the canon of scriptures. It's inspired, it's inspired, you know, it's a letter that he wrote to an individual which brings back that truth that God is interested in individuals. God, you know, we, we see sometimes as, you know, um, in the big picture, that God does everything he does for the world. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him you know, shall have everlasting life. So, you know, it's a collective thing. God does this for everybody. But the Lord shows us over and over again, it boils down to individuals. He does this individually for each and every one of us and, and, and each and every one of you. And that's what made the difference for me when I, as I came into a relationship with Jesus, I remember, you know, when I was a teenager and a light bulb went on and I understood, the light came on and I, I saw that Jesus did what he did for me, Alan Blaine. He loved me and died for me. And it became
became personal made all the difference for me. It wasn't just for the world. It was for Alan Plain. And so God sees us individually, and he knows us. He knows, he knows us all by name. He knows how many hairs you have on your head. He knows everything about you. He's very interested, intimately interested in you. And so he saw this individual, Onesimus, a runaway slave, the bottom of society, somebody who was not even viewed as a human being, but as a possession, as property. God saw him, and he was deeply concerned about this individual. And he was also concerned about the other party involved in this. You know, the, the person who had been his master, his owner, a well-to-do Colossian um, who had gotten saved, probably under Paul. Um, and Paul had never been to Colossae that we know of at this time, but during his third missionary journey, he had been to Ephesus, which was not far away. And so he had been hearing, you know, feedback and reports of what was going on in the churches, and as was his custom, he was writing back to give oversight and counsel and correction and advice and to lay down theology and to um, also speak personal words of encouragement. And so Paul, it, faced with this predicament in that Onesimus, when he ran away, he ended up going to Paul, and I wonder whether he did it intentionally. Maybe he found out where Paul was, and he's a runaway, and very, very likely he had stolen money from his master, Philemon, on his way out. And he's on the run, but he has heard about Paul because Philemon had become a believer. And so whatever the circumstances were, you know, we don't know that part of it. We don't know all this information. So we just, we, we try to put bits and pieces together and connect the dots. And it's interesting sometimes just to think, well, what if, what if? You know, we don't know if it was by him intentionally finding Paul and going to him and seeking his advice, or whether it was just a divine appointment where God arranged the circumstances so that their paths crossed, and lo and behold, he hears the gospel from Paul, and he gets saved. He comes to know Jesus Christ. And so Paul knows both of these guys. He knows this runaway slave who's now gotten saved. He also knows the guy he ran away from. Philemon. And he, so he says, I got, we've got to see if we can get this mess straightened out. Uh, th this is a can of worms, and, and we, need to, we need to resolve it. And so he writes this letter, very possibly. Onesimus is looking over his shoulder as he writes, you know. And he's like, no, you got to say it stronger than that. <laughs> you you got to, you know, really make this, make, really sell it. You know, you got to sell it. And, and so Paul does sell it, you know, and he does a good job with that. I left my Bible down there. I need it. <laughs> Thank you. You know, his approach and the structure of the letter, and this is from a commentary right in, the, in front of the book of Philemon in my study Bible here, but it says, to win Philemon's willing acceptance of Onesimus, Paul writes very tactfully, somewhat tactfully, I would say, and in a lighthearted tone, which he creates with a wordplay, which we noted already. And the appeal is organized in a way prescribed by ancient Greek and Roman teachers to build rapport, to persuade the mind, and to move the emotions. The name Onesimus is not mentioned until that rapport has been built, and the appeal itself is stated only near the end of the of the letter to persuade the mind. So he built it up, he built his case, and then he, he sprung it. He sprung it on him, you know, he said, yes, I'm talking about Onesimus. And he's like a son to me, and I'm like a father to him. And, you know, 
He's, now he's useful to me. And I'm sure he will want, once again be useful to you. And so now I want you to receive him back as a brother, as a member of the family. Amazing. And, and as the little um, video said, it was explosive, actually. This was explosive because it did a radical thing. It leveled the playing field. You know, uh, in Christ, the playing field is level. In Christ, we are all equal. And so Paul, he doesn't address the sin of slavery. Slavery was a, was a fact of life in the Roman world at that time. It was entrenched in their culture. Nobody thought anything about it. It's just the way it was. It's just the way it was. They might have, been, they, they might have um, had a twinge of conscience from time to time. But most of them, you know, it was, just, it was just the way it is. It is what it is. So he doesn't call it out and say, this thing of slavery is, is ungodly and it's wrong, but he doesn't have to say it like that. He just says, I want you to receive him as a man and as a brother. And that, you know, the book of Philemon was one of the strongest parts of scripture that helped uh, bring it into slavery here in the United States and in England. And, um, you know, uh, without actually coming right out and attacking the institution of slavery, it laid, it laid a foundation for people to begin to realize that slavery was incompatible um, with, with Scripture and with uh, Christianity. And, um, you know, it's like the founding, our founding documents in the United States. You know, uh, when as we were coming into our own, and the colonies began to to uh, resist the ungodly tyranny um, of English rule, and we finally decided to declare our independence. And in the Declaration of Independence, you know, penned by Thomas Jefferson. You know, he said, we find these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Well, that was penned during a time when slavery was an institution here in the United States. Yeah. And yet, that laid the groundwork. You know, we had it in our founding documents that that's not the way it ought to be. And a lot of our founding fathers knew that that's not the way it ought to be. But, you know, it, it did, that change was not going to happen overnight. It was a process. You know, and so this book of Philemon served a very, a very uh, powerful um, catalyst for helping to bring an, in, an end to the institution of slavery. As I said, in, in England, which it happened in England before it happened in the United States, but it eventually happened in the United States too. On May 22nd, 1787, a group of British Quakers in London formed the Committee for the Abolition of the Slave Trade, which later became the Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade. They worked to educate the public about the abuses of slavery and sought the eradication of the slave trade. As, as its official seal or engraved device and motto, the group chose the image of an enslaved African in chains kneeling with raised hands grasped together above the figure is the inscription am I not a man and a brother remember that am I not a man and, and a brother and so that's what began bringing up that realization of the truth you know it's, it's not right for, for a person to own another person uh, we're all equal in God uh, in God's sight so that's just another side benefit of this book of Philemon. But, you know, and, and why this book is so important, you know, uh, but how do we apply th this book to our lives personally? How, how do you, how, what kind of application can you bring from Philemon to your own personal life this morning? 
you know, as we walk away from the building today, how is this word going to change us and bring forth some good fruit in us? Um, I, you know, my takeaway from this this morning, for me personally, is that God is God is interested in individuals, and he's, he's, he's interested in my individual life. That forgiveness is of paramount importance, and and forgiveness sometimes is inconvenient and costly. Sometimes for us to forgive somebody, it costs us something. Um, but it's worth it. And and also that reconciliation is very important to God. God is in the business of reconciliation. Amen? Amen. That's what Jesus did. He came that we might be reconciled with God. And... And as Paul told the Corinthians, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, 2 Corinthians 5.19. And he has committed to us, get this, he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. That's our message to the world. Be reconciled to God. And he has made us ambassadors of reconciliation. We have that ministry, guys. The ministry of reconciliation. We've been reconciled to God. And our message to the world is be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Amen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. Well, that's it. That's the word for today. Thank you, we read an entire book of the Bible this morning. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't know if Mike had planned to, to uh, touch on fighting or not. He and I did not consult before he headed to Tennessee. He did not put on me any request about what my word was to be this morning. Um, and so we're going to be moving on past this section of scripture for next week. So um, we'll see what happens next Sunday. Um, but let's just continue on our journey together as we read the scriptures. It's wonderful, isn't it? Yes. Would you stand, please? Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you, Lord, for the book of Philemon and for speaking to us this morning, Lord. And, and we just ask that you would allow this word to get down inside of us and to get rooted, rooted down deep in our hearts, Lord, and to bear good fruit in our lives. We pray, Lord, that we will not just be hearers of the word today, but that we will be doers of the word. Help us, Lord, to forgive um, even as Philemon had to forgive Onesimus, help us, Lord, to be willing to forgive and help us, Lord, to, to be your ministers, your ambassadors of reconciliation. We thank you, Lord. We love you. I speak blessing over your people today. May the blessing of the Lord rest upon you as you go forth May you go in his anointing and in the power of God. Do not be discouraged. Do not be afraid. Be encouraged. Be bold. Have courage. Go forth in victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.